uh, before i start this session uh, i like to request the members i am quite sure most of the members would be, would be aware that bca has started a signature petition on scrapping of the icds and those who have still not signed i would request you please do it it is there on our web website also uh, as on date we have got around 3368 signatures already and if you don't move fast then uh, before the budget at least i think we should do something on it we require at least 10000 signatures to appeal to the government that this is something which has to be scrapped uh, and uh, not complicate our life any further <clears throat> so speaker of the day kushal thakar joint secretary suhas paranjape my colleague on the dais gracey all those who have now logged in and viewing this relay live seniors ladies and gentlemen welcome everyone to this lecture meeting on crude diplomacy and global economy in the last lecture meeting we had an interesting discussion on cyber crime cyber security and cyber laws and uh, the speaker was uh, ca sachin patil from the mumbai police the meeting uh, the lecture meeting has now been hosted on the youtube and we already have more than 500 views today we have another non technical lecture uh, on this topic of crude diplomacy in today's time in a, in in an interwoven interconnected economy it is imperative for a professional to be known of what is going on in various segments today what we know is what media tells us what we read on the internet what we hear from our acquaintances and from publications today what is reported what is projected what is forecasted and what is the actual reality can be poles apart there could be something brewing but kept under wraps there could be something vital yet kept under covers there could be something to showcase in a manner that is quite different than what it really is the commodity segment is one such area if stock markets fall or rise there is there will be a host of experts interviewed by the media who will start predicting the future with so called convincing reasons however when it comes to commodities which are vital to the functioning of the economies and in turn affect the stock markets importance of its movement is given us uh, is uh, importance of its movements is to given a step motherly treatment by the media it is not due to the fact that the media does not realize its importance but is due to the very fact that this niche area has very limited experts who can be easily assessed for their genuine viewpoints one of the vital commodities which affect the economies across the globe is crude the demand and supply of crude is not just a function of oil exploration and the new finds around the world of oil reserve reservoirs it goes beyond economies and is it is highly politically influenced commodity the 70% oil fall since mid 2014 therefore raises a host of political questions the international energy market has changed in fundamental ways it is because of this reason that the topic for today has been termed as crude diplomacy and global economy oil is no longer a scarce resource anymore in today's economic times we have these headlines crude oil will touch dollar 10 in the next coming 10 maybe 5 to 10 years with the reason that there are a few experts who are authoritatively deal with this politically sensitive commodity and kushal thakar being one of them it was felt apt to have this lecture meeting last year when kushal was asked his view on crude again crossing us dollar 100 he categorically said that this eventuality was impossible to happen ever again and it may the crude may fall down to maybe 20 dollars or maybe 30 dollars and he was quite correct in his prediction but the question is where all this will will lead to how has india positioned itself politically in this crude diplomacy will renewable energy play a significant role in disturbing the oil dependency and is hydrogen the new fuel to answer all these questions and many more from the floor we have with us mr kushal thakar he is a visit uh, i request you all to welcome him with a loud applause <clears throat> mr kushal thakar is a dear friend in fact we did our article ship together and then at that time only we could sense his passion for the research in market uh, in stock market and the commodities and eventually 
uh, he went uh, with his heart he left the ca profession and today he is now here before us delivering this lecture <clears throat> over the years he has gained considerable expertise and a, in a, as a commodity trading consultant and his practice has been concentrated in the areas of commodity trading commodity research and hedging strategies for the clients he has made numerous presentations to the commodity exchanges international commodity associations corporate and management institutions his value driven approach to the commodity business has always provided him with the ability to understand discover align and control the value chain and business processes he is an active trader in the commodity market involved in both physical and futures trading his main strength is in commodity trading comes from through the extensive networks and crop survey in fact he just uh, returned uh, yesterday night from uh, from a crop survey uh, in fact he visits the, the farmers he checks the soil he interviews the farmers and he then he, that is how he does the research over the years he has established a strong network that has, that has enabled him to exchange information and understand well the global factors influencing the prices of the commodities he is a visiting faculty member of most top ranked management institutions in the india and has addressed a multitude of seminars across commodity exchanges and international commodity associations around the world he is a regular guide at iim bangalore to teach applied economics and risk management systems and analysis of assets once again please join me in welcoming kushal thakar before i request him to take the proceedings uh, to uh, start his lecture delivering his lecture i may request mr pranay bhai our past president to say uh, because we are going to release our pocket diary and uh, pocket diary and table diary today so he may just introduce that uh, what what is there all about why we had not done it along with the referencer and why now thank you please pranay bhai please <clears throat> good evening friends president chetan uh, secretary suhas grace and speaker of the evening mr kushal well as chetan has said that uh, as uh, many of the members must be knowing that it was used to be a practice for last 54 years to have a referencer come diary of the bca the publication on this basis but as you know now we are moving towards very fast to the digital economy and all that so need was felt as a matter of fact as you know the diary is supposed to be a very concept as a calendar year diary but because of our reference are being always be being released in june and july because the budget is getting passed in may and all that so that was linked to july and june but then year after year then we felt that uh, along with the demand of the uh, diary was getting reduced considerably because of the digital age because all mobiles now people are not caring but people like me old generation still prefer to have some sort of a diary like that so we continue this so this year we have decided since uh, okay, this is to be dealing with the referencer and all that and we have decided to the calendar uh, with the calendar year as the diary for the purpose and this may we have made a point that introducing this 2017 as a calendar diary we have made it a point that very important aspect of the referencer very important data like few data basic data related to income tax even the sell tax and uh, excise and company law and all that has been very in a precise form few pages has been devoted to this along with the other important reference number like it office and all that which is used to be in diary so we are content and calendar as you must be aware that we are coming out calendar with every year themes and all that and that has responded to very nice things and i think we are selling almost 25000 calendars to the members giving the important dates which are the functions and all that so in this bca diaries also we are having a, all the important dates along with the referencer material and purposely we have dinged it as i have explained and now and again the things are getting changed again the yeah, we don't know the financial year may be also become a calendar year very fast and all that so we don't know again it may be combined with the referencer if it becomes a calendar year so I, as a long association my bcs with this reference and diary i had a privilege chetan bhai has asked me to come and release this uh, diary so i am associated myself but before i request mr kusal to release i take this opportunity to thank all my team particularly uh, chairman nausad panjwani is the chairman of the members in public relation 
when he has entirely devoted these talks to me and i compliment my editors yatin desai rajiv shah sangeeta pandit kinjal bhuta and deepak sai and all those person who have made really good efforts and last but not least is the printer who has made a good effort and this year our theme is legendary artist of india so if you will see that we have picked up some 10 12 artist legendary artists of india and a beautiful picture of those thing is there also there so that has also been there so let's see it's uh, be useful to the members those who are used to it those who are very tech savvy may not like the crew carry and all that when those who are interested we'll find it in next year we'll see how it happens again so with this word i request mr kusal to inaugurate and pocket diary as chetan has said is also a very popular thing people are not carrying the big diary but at least the pocket diary so that is also very useful you can carry other way मे आर रिक्वेस्ट यू हास to offer a memento as a mark of our gratitude and love for kushal kushal the floor is all yours hello हेलो इट्स इट्स नॉट एट पी एम एंड आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू बिगिन द स्पीच सेइंग मित्रो भाई और बहनो इट्स गोइंग टू बी स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड थैंकिंग ऑब्वियसली द कमिटी फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी वंस अगेन आई सपोज वॉट वॉज मैंशन टू मी दर वॉज अ ओवरवेलमिंग रिस्पॉन्स लास्ट इयर सो there has been a reinvitation and i have a good memory i do see very common faces once again so that makes me happy that at least i know whom i am addressing once again and i know what kind of questions are going to be asked to me also so <laughs> so let me begin now obviously oil so and whatever recently has happened opec for me the abbreviation is slightly different in the sense is organization of petroleum exporting cartel i don't use the word countries because this is the greatest official cartel created by the oil producing countries and they have done nothing but manipulation there is no doubt that the importance of opec is reducing and diminishing year after year but it still has a lot of nuisance value and that is what they try to rake up every now and then with whatever major fluctuations are likely to happen with countries which are not a part of opec so what i'm planning to do today is we analyze do a little bit of number crunching of uh, whatever the recent opec deal has been signed we look at the non opec situation uh, i'll try and analyze what is my 
thinking on it and eventually what most of your like is me linking crude with the equity scripts so i would be trying to end it with that and give me a 30 35 minutes for it and after which i will take up all the questions as you all feel like so the deal was signed um in a couple of weeks ago to cut the production by 1.2 million barrels a day where opec has signed the deal that brings the production to 32.5 million barrels a day where opec is concerned last week there was a meeting between the opec and the non opec countries and the non opec countries have decided to cut about 558000 barrels a day wherein russia is going to have the major cut of around uh, 300000 barrels a day but let's look into it total production of crude as per the official statistics is close to 92 million barrels a day currently most opec is peaking out at, at around 33 million barrels a day the non opec currently still control 65% of the production with us and russia now controlling the majority of it and obviously many other countries do come and participate in it what has happened just now crude oil was happily at between i mean the mid 30 level all the importing countries like india china and everybody were happy about it even if their currency was weak there was not an issue but now suddenly this deal has been cut the prices have suddenly shot up from mid 30s to mid 50s the whole thing is still a manipulation we still have very high inventories which these people are controlling it they don't want to release a lot of things to the global markets no matter what may be the price long term contracts obviously where opec non opec countries are concerned it's not the issue where tomorrow india requires 3 million barrels a day we just go and say okay aaj 3 million barrel de do parso another 4 million barrel de do nothing happens that way everything is a long term contract and all these contracts are minimum from 9 months to 15 months it happens so if all the countries are auto have already landed into long term contracts that means this rise which has happened is nothing but an opec push of the prices that they are trying to compete they are trying to control their own market share so that that does not reduce vis a vis russia and usa and they know that they cannot compete with them on an individual basis so it's better that we have an organization again there is another parallel organization wherein the non opec people also meet together and they decide their own terms and conditions and this whole routine moves in a cycle every 5 years looking at the number crunching now the deal has to start from the second week of january where people have to start cutting the production i have some issues to it how do you check that there are so many countries which are producing today saudi arabia has peaked at 10.9 million barrels a day what is the guarantee that they are going to cut their 800000 barrels we don't know that let's presume yes they take a self interest because they want to control their market share and their pricing because their economy is in trouble they do it they still are sitting on huge inventories how does how do we check if five mother loads of ships are moving out of their port a sixth one can move unaccounted for that is what has been happening in the past i mean in in the rogue countries like iraq and libya we've seen shipments being controlled by terrorists and they've been selling it at 10 dollars a barrel discount the same thing can happen now also and this time it may happen in an official manner so that is going to be one issue to check higher prices secondly uh somebody last week had raised an issue from europe that once this deal is struck obviously they will be manipulating a lot of things and the prices have gone up 
aren't the shale oil people coming in in time because already now they are in a, in a decent amount of profit i said there is a big issue where us is concerned there is no doubt us is currently one of the second largest producers of crude oil but the history goes is us originally used to be a net importer of crude oil hence all the pipelines in usa have been made from the gulf coast cities moving towards the north and the east of the country they have been single flow pipelines there is no double flow pipelines so now when the shale oil is coming see till to date shale oil was being transported by train rakes or by uh, runaway trucks but if the production is going to increase from 4.5 million barrels a day to possibly 7 or 8 as the forecast is being done they require a dual pipeline that is yet not in place so there is a small period of time possibly a year where opec can still control through their manipulative practices about higher prices but once these pipelines are ready we will have shale flowing back to the gulf cities and as i had mentioned last year to the same group us will once again turn out to be a net exporter of not only the oil part of it but even the petroleum products part of it and huge refineries and petrochemical units are coming across the gulf coast cities in usa so that is one thing which everybody needs to keep in mind including the saudi arab arab and as well as their opec members that things can be different and time is an issue for them also they also have to buck up to whatever is the global economic situation and us is obviously with trump in there is going to be a revolutionizing construction of new pipelines and all and wishfully where we are concerned especially where india is concerned higher crude prices is not good for us with the weakening rupee seeing the current status going on so once this happens i am pretty certain crude oil prices have to start coming down it could be a angelic fall collapse also but till that time yes it can move towards higher 60s or maybe the 70s also but cannot go with it personally speaking looking from this again perspective keeping us russia saudi arabia aside we also need to see the cost of production a lot of oil which iran is now going to come out after their sanctions have been raised is actually the picking up cost is only 5 dollars a barrel what is happening is the marketing cost is 25 times of that and that is where the problem starts where these costs start increasing the insurance premium currently if uh, most of the oil tankers which are passing through the suez canal whenever there is a slight problem in iraq or libya automatically the insurance premium goes up to 7 7 1/2 dollars a barrel when there is peace around the middle east and the west asia regions the insurance premiums drop to 2 2 and a half dollars a barrel so that is also one more thing which speculators investors and hedgers have to continuously keep in mind in which direction the world is moving from all angles and how crude oil has to be the costing is worked out by these people now libya and iran will be two countries we need to watch out for in the sense is they have not yet achieved their full production capacity which was in the the heydays 5 years ago and where opec is concerned they have got a kind of a exemption that they can go up to their peak production and then they can freeze their productions there so they are the two countries who will not be doing the cutting of production but the question remains is that if they go back to the heydays iran at that particular point of time was the third largest producer and if they with the new technology which they have come in with if they start crossing that 
how do you stop that so there is still going to be more crude oil coming out into the world all right libya once the problems come to an end the country unites the production smoothens libya itself can start hitting 5 5 and a half million barrels a day which again is going to be enough now if everybody starts hitting their peak i am not discussing the cutting of production as of now if everybody starts hitting a peak automatically the crude oil production is going to cross 100 million barrels a day and some of the economists goldman sachs and all have predicted that by the year 2040 the demand is likely to be 109 million barrels a day but without any efforts we are already going to cross 100 million barrels a day within 5 years itself and plus we need to remember that a lot of substitutes are moving in now this brings me to a separate faction in the sense i am not covering shale oil and everything because most of you all are aware and obviously us is going to bank on shale oil production which is likely to be 50% of their normal onshore offshore productions all right keeping that aside we are also going to have canada and all also moving into shale oil and even if they introduce just 2 to 2 and a half million barrels a day that is enough surplus that could be generated in times to come the second faction which i need to look into is natural gas because with crude oil i have to take natural gas it cannot go in fact if you all are lo looking from an investment perspective i would rather say natural gas has a little as a slight better future than crude oil in the sense is the usage of natural gas is increasing not only due to climatic changes obviously where global warming is concerned a lot of gas is pumped for the air conditioning part of it where europe and usa is concerned where the winters are severe you require the heating mechanisms to be working and heating oil is losing slight importance over the last few years and natural gas has taken over because obviously there's a cost benefit to to it now natural gas also is replacing one of the most important cracking product of crude oil that is naphtha where entire asia is concerned fertilizer industry is switching from naphtha to natural ga gas which is more green more economical and there is no disruptions because when naphtha was concerned obviously it was controlled by a few companies the prices used to be very fluctuating and it used to be a problem where the costs were concerned and that is where the fertilizer companies apart from the government pricing mechanisms they used to get affected on their cost of raw material side of it now where gas is concerned it is a matter of on and off most of the pipelines are ready even where india is concerned and this is going to turn out to be an advantages for fertilizer companies you all can have a look into some of them so so this is going to be a very important feature for natural gas over and above that now in the last decade the technology is there where the gas can be liquefied and it can be transported across the world see before there used to be a time where liquefaction used to be double the price of natural gas and over and above that there is another 50% increase where certain other logistics were concerned and another 20% increase where we had to defreeze it so that again it comes into the gas formation but the new technologies have made it more economical for the transport logistics as well as for liquefying and deliquefying it and that is going to be an advantages for a lot of countries which want to convert themselves from a crude oil economy to a gas economy india certainly has got certain policies on that how the parliament passes i don't know but yes if we move in that particular direction india's usage of hydrocarbons there is going to be a mass substitution effect that is likely to take place where in currently where we are importing more than 3 million barrels a day it can be reduced by nearly 20 25% which is going to be beneficial to us and where gas is concerned india itself produces gas we just require the right policy to increase our exploration so that we are self sufficient where our own gas is concerned 
and obviously all the companies which are going to be involved in it again shifting tracks moving into the equity perspective gas producing companies companies which are setting up the pipelines from b2c c2c b2b in all kinds of way are going to be beneficial so it's going to be a whole affiliated industry that is going to move with natural gas and the current pricing of natural gas is much lower because what is happening is the usage has not yet increased the way it is supposed to because of the slow process of the infra development where we are concerned but where europe is concerned yes it has moved at a very rapid pace and that is exactly the reason why we've seen natural gas double in last two years because automatically the shift has happened over there because europe is the only continent where crude oil is not produced enough so they have to look into other sources and for them the best source is natural gas because the pipelines which can come from ukraine across europe or from some of the other middle east countries via turkey moving into europe becomes very economical transportation for them and that is exactly the reason why the importance of natural gas has suddenly increased and before we are caught unawares and if you want to invest money that is the sector to look into currently now again again from an equity perspective everybody looks into aviation turbine fuel uh aviation turbine fuel is nothing but a triple refined kerosene and that is what is if we look into the financials of any airline company whether it is india foreign or whatever it is 40% of the operating cost is aviation turbine fuel 30% is the crew and the engineers if 40% is atf rise and fall of atf can easily be superimposed on your balance sheets of airline companies it moves in tandem and atf prices are fixed by the government on a month to month basis if you look into any of our airline companies from jet airways to spicejet to indigo i'm uh, being india specific just now you can see it that whenever the prices of atf have gone up by 10% the scripts have fallen by 20% there is a there is a 2x impact straight on and it is it's a thumb rule you don't even have to look into the balance sheet at that particular point of time once you have done the analysis just go with it and it actually happens unless and until some other factors are also playing with it but in a normal circumstances atf versus airlines it's a straight forward play which happens where india is concerned as well as where the global airlines are concerned now if by chance let's say there is a 5% probability that i may be on the wrong side where crude oil is concerned i do believe crude oil cannot cross 100 dollars a barrel because huge shale oil and everything is going to come into feature there have been many articles stating that shale oil cost is nearly 50 dollars plus a barrel but it is not true uh i can back it with statistics number one is uh, you all can look into some of the top american companies uh, one is rystad energy the other is dunberry resources these are the top two producers of shale oil and their balance sheet cost is 35 dollars a barrel but the average cost of shale oil is yes it is 50 dollars a barrel but the question is that the statistics have got a little weighted even the companies which are producing at 58 dollars a barrel have started using a lot of hedging techniques they've started using the new technology which is produced by baker hughes and halliburton which is coming into play wherein originally i'm going a little technical on the engineering side so that you all understand what i'm trying to say is till today whenever the fracking used to take place to remove shale oil it used to be a single hydraulic drill which used to go through the rocks and a single pipe would be put and everything would be sucked up eventually from last year the technology is 
that it not only moves in a vertical fashion but it also goes in a horizontal fashion so they don't have to go and break another rock it's if one major rock on a centralized basis is broken through they can convert the driller into an horizontal motion at a 90 degrees and they can move under the ground into the second rock and that can be produced a month ago when i was running through the annual report of baker hughes uh, disclaimer i am an investor in that i also found is that they have come up with a triple drilling mechanism wherein once a pipe is inside it can move in both the directions now if that happens the cost of producing shale oil falls another 22% and even if a person is producing at 58 dollars a barrel because there are some of the companies who are producing that automatically their costs of production are going to fall now it depends on how they want to project it and how they want to market it but where financials are concerned because as chartered accountants we know we are supposed to be good at financials this is the fact and it is written down in their financials i am not making my own figures from here and if these companies if the prices by chance shoot up a lot and if they really get the advantage to de-hedge themselves that would be the best thing for them as well as for countries like india because we are i think the only country or the only importing country in the world where we don't have a centralized commodity reserve system wherein whichever be the commodity not just oil and gas but it could be wheat sugar or anything where the government does not have a team to start hedging in the international markets to protect our own costs we are the only ones china and all have gone way ahead of usa also where this is concerned because eventually it was an importing country and they had to do something about it so i wish some day such a thing could happen wherein we we don't face the unnecessary volatility of the commodities across the board now again where crude oil is concerned coming to the equity markets which most of the people are interested the affiliates rise and fall in crude affects the petrochemicals it eventually affects even plastics the polymers so rising crude oil is obviously bad as a raw material cost for the polymers and vice versa so that industry also gets affected in case if they do not have the inventories of their petro products at a lower price now most of our indian companies do maintain a lot of inventories now because they cannot hedge so it is better to move and buy or sell their products on a long term basis so that is what many companies have started adopting it secondly rubber again the tire industry also gets affected with crude oil now obviously the question is going to be how the issue is there is always a play off between natural rubber and synthetic rubber synthetic rubber is a produce of petro products and the production or let's say on the from the other uh, aspect where the consumption of rubber is concerned 25% of rubber is synthetic rubber now synthetic rubber and natural rubber have a direct play with crude because if crude oil prices are rising there is a shift towards natural rubber by the tire companies and if it is the other way around there is a shift towards the synthetic rubber so once again it is the inventory data that is very crucial for most of these companies and the decision which they take because there have been many times i have seen in fact in tire stocks that some of them just collapse with a rising crude prices but some can sustain that and what we hear on the television channels is the company has come up with a capex plan and all that see i can't digest it because if a company during a bad phase has come with a capex plan why does a share price go up because automatically the raw material prices are not going to be conducive to their growth but when i dig deeply into their balance sheets or on the quarterly results which i call on the companies 
I really understand that they are sitting with huge inventories at a lower price. So now if the prices are moving in a different direction, these are the people who immediately start increasing on their margins and obviously their earnings per share takes a growth. So, so that is how I you know, start digging into the figures, start doing my own statistical analysis to understand how crude is going to affect which company in what particular manner, whether they are on the raw material side of it or whether they are on the finished side of it. And all this can be put on an Excel sheet. It could be put on the right or the left side of the balance sheets and the P&L account. And we would be in a much better way to predict the companies where they are going. And we don't have to follow the normal discounted cash flow method, which normally everybody follows. And personally, I say it never works out. It's rather it is better to understand the commodity and substitute it into the balance sheets to get a better analytical figure from it. Uh, I think I'll hold over here. <laughs> Before I move into the next, I'll, it's better I take on the questions because otherwise I can keep on going on and on and I may not be on track where you all are concerned. So that is why. Yeah, uh, all all your reserve figures, all right. Uh, where uh, are we being India specific or we are being global? Yeah. Global. The U.S. Department, USDA website has got figures which are 90% reliable. Obviously, 10% here and there is likely to take place, and they cover all the countries. And uh, they have a hydrocarbon section also where you can get all other petro products also into it. It's a it's a very clean drawn. That gives a lot of comfort now. Yes, that gives a lot of comfort. In fact, I would. Yes, if if you are not globally, you have to rely on those figures. There is no doubt about it. But where India is concerned, from the last five years, uh, the figures given by the Ministry of Hydrocarbons on their website are also very accurate. Because see, usually I have developed a phase where I don't believe in any figures that are published. But over the last two decades, wherever I have done my research, I have always gone to the fields, whether it is where crops are concerned or whether it is geological surveys are concerned. I have gone, picked up the data, and then I have cross-verified whatever has been published. So I know exactly that now whatever figures are published by the Indian government are more or less accurate where the hydrocarbon ministry is concerned. And they, they keep on updating it on a week-to-week -week basis. Not only that, they also update the, they have an Excel sheet wherein the entire formula is there that how they arrive at our petrol and diesel prices because it is a very weird method in which they calculate it. It's not a straightforward, okay, we take the Brent crude prices and obviously everything is worked out from commission to the exchange rate to the cracking ratios and all that. It doesn't go that way. In fact, how these people take the base is, we take our Oman-Dubai combination basket, which is X Singapore, and from there our calculations happen. No. No. This is how we are supposed to pay. It, 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 it is not realistic, because in the census, Tomorrow, even if we buy crude from Indonesia or Saudi Arabia, the formula remains the same. And there is a vast difference in the cost of uh, our own purchases. Many times it is on the lower side. So whatever it is, we are paying a lot to the government. That, that used to be the case. Now the question of subsidies doesn't hurt. Ah, we are subsidizing. Yes, yeah, that is true. That is true. But all figures are pretty authenticated. Can you please comment on the coal industry? Uh, see, in the US, they have virtually discouraged coal through regulations. Now, at some point in time, the coal price can become attractive as a fuel. But then again, regulations will remain there. Now, actually, the question that I am trying to drive at is, for uh, environmental reasons, this 
this has been discouraged now such a risk to my mind will uh, visit uh, even the fracking industry now will the price which is now being paid for uh, fracking oil uh, factoring a, a regulatory cost okay let's put it in this particular manner germany is giving up nuclear energy and moving towards thermal coal all right so there is there is a shift happening in all the countries depending on how their resources are placed now your question is going to be again india specific or we are talking global it's india specific it is india specific okay now where india specific is concerned we need to remember that whatever coal reserves though we have the largest coal reserves in the world all our coal is c grade and d grade we do not have a and b grade now if that particular coal is going to be utilized to generate electricity let's say for a thermal power plant i'm sure some of you all must have done this statistics for a thermal power plant we require 6300 calorific value coal all right and if an a grade is put in you require less than 3 million tons for 1 megawatt all right but when you are using c and d grade you require nearly 10 million tons to produce the same amount of electricity at the same calorific value because our own sulfur content is very high and our ash is a little on the lower side of it so that heat is not enough to generate it hence all these years though we had the largest coal reserves still our companies used to import coal from indonesia and obviously adani group went to australia which is a failed project but anyway that is what everybody is designing to bring in the b grade coal mix it with c and d so that you arrive at some kind of an in between figure of 5 and a half 6 million tons per megawatt and you can keep on producing electricity but in looking at this larger scenario keeping obviously the environmental issues and everything aside coal will be beneficial where this is concerned if you are comparing it with crude oil and the substitutes for crude oil crude oil has to be constantly above 70 dollars a barrel then only it is beneficial to have coal coming in and obviously there are now technologies where you know these coal washeries or the clean coal technology which has come but we have to remember that the cost of a clean coal is rising by 10 to 12% so are people willing to pay for that so that is going to be a question eventually to be asked otherwise i agree with you that yes whatever is beneficial to us we are going to do forget the green environment because china never bothered about it but the question is is it cost beneficial to the company to go ahead with it thank you my question is directly on that diplomatic thing <laughs> so that was i think one of the uh, sure uh, with trump coming in and his you know secretary of state being ex mobile guy and whatever is happening between uh, us of the trump and with uh, russia being so friendly and usa having sort of a cold war with china and usa having under trump not having a uh, good relationship with iran as he has publicly said where does all this diplomatic uh, uh, you know things will lead the oil because a lot of things are driven by diplomacy because you know how russia was brought down uh, is only through a diplomatic uh, absolutely i totally agree with you last time also you had asked me a similar question <laughs> <laughs> all right now let now let's look at it in a different scenario all right keeping diplomacy aside eventually crude oil is the commodity that is most important for all the countries for 90% of the countries in this world all right now if you want to break a country which is again an oil producing country would you like the prices to be up or would you like it down exactly so if us and iran are not going to be in friendly or terms the best thing is to break crude oil so there'll be a manipulation on the other side of it all right because what we saw just now when the crude oil was below 40 dollars a barrel the entire west asia and middle east 
they had to come out with more and more bonds to fund their own country their forex reserves and everything was come going down in fact close to zero except for saudi arabia but in that process saudi arabia lost 60% of its forex reserves now with the oil prices back obviously they are getting some chances to recuperate but the question remains is who goes on what side as usual right from the 60s we know oil is a weapon that is used by everybody whether it is a consuming country or a buying country i mean sorry or a selling country all right now if what happens if iran and us come together see eventually they used to be friends in the past when the shah of iran was there it is only when khomeini came in there were differences which were created but now where the current situation is concerned no matter what they are saying their relationships are moving closer to each other because that is the only thing they can do if they want to do away with the threat of isil which is standing at the doorstep all right so here you could you could easily have a nexus where iran us and saudi arabia all can have very good relationship amongst themselves and in that kind of a situation i'm not saying they will keep the crude oil prices up but yes there would be some flooring to the crude oil prices and they will allow it to go in a in a natural kind of a situation because today also i claim if there was no diplomacy if there was no opec if there was no non opec committee meeting if everybody was allowed to produce and export crude oil as we did in a free market zone crude oil prices would collapse to below 20 dollars a barrel and that would be beneficial to all the consumption countries but that is not the case so we continuously have to look into as you said who is with whom and accordingly it will be decided and that is the reason why crude oil keeps on fluctuating on a day to day basis and forget the companies forget the speculators but even many economies indirectly are taking positions in crude crude oil to save their own country's costs otherwise it is not going to be easy i said india is not one of them but a country like japan has no natural resource except for what they produce rice everything is imported by japan and on so many years whether crude oil was at 30 dollars a barrel or 120 dollars a barrel japan has still thrived then they've played the game of crude oil hedging in the most brilliant manner which anybody could think of otherwise that country would have already been finished a country that faced 14 years of recession and they've just come out of it no country can withstand that and that is exactly i mean in in fact if, even if you look at the i mean obviously we always look at the gdps of every economy but if you look at the actual balance sheet of japan you will know exactly how they have worked out their own uh, way through and how they have controlled all the commodities which they have consumed because eventually that is the commodity decides where the country is heading to not bonds and not equities equities finally is an economic barometer but commodities is the underlying asset of the country that if it if it can export and import and the pricing at which that decides whether the country is moving up or not and its impact falls on the currency also i hope i have see let's let, let's let's put it uh in the current situation we've had modi here we are having trump there you are having rightist capitalist people taking the center stage in france also in the primary elections we've seen the rightist and the capitalist coming in hollande is going to move out sarkozy is not winning you are going to have either le pen or the other person who may come in as the president so you are going to have another capitalist coming in we are having german elections also coming in merkel has always been a socialist a person who wanted to keep europe together she may lose this time and again in germany there is an undercurrent of a rightist moving in okay sorry i have been using the word rightist i would rather say capitalist because i myself am a capitalist i would prefer a capitalist running any country any time you know because that is the only way a country can grow and where russia is concerned where putin is concerned he is more a capitalist than a socialist and that is why he's been able to bring russia out of all the problems after whatever the collapse had happened 
where the country was severed. We go with the situation, right? We will go with the scenario. See, I, I, I'm still telling you, I would favor, I would put my money on crude eventually collapsing. How fast and when, within the next five years, we'll come to know. Because this is not going to be a, a story for 10 years or 20 years. In five years, it will be decided in which direction crude is heading. And if crude remains on the upside, we also need to understand that there is going to be a huge drop in the consumption of petrol and diesel where crude is concerned because the way electric cars are moving in it is going and once they can control their cost of production we ourselves are going to shift to it in california obviously where tesla is concerned i mean i just came from chicago and i was there for a couple of months every fifth car is a tesla and in california the proportion is much higher so that is what is happening and, it, and Tesla has decided that we want to come out with cheaper cars and if they can actually bring that which is competing with any other normal car, why wouldn't we buy it? So crude is going to have a lot of competition. Uh, right now, natural gas uh, is generally a derivative price based uh, or in relation to uh, crude hmm. but do we see a situation where natural gas also could be a genuinely a market driven price i mean like say henry hub today is supposed to be closest to a market driven yes that is true so we are already in that situation where the demand supply factors are only determining the natural gas prices because again like crude oil see the uh, as of now today every wednesday night we have the crude oil inventories which come out i'm sure a lot of investors and speculators are aware of it that once it becomes 730 the first thing they are checking out is the crude oil inventories and once they come for the first half an hour crude oil moves in any direction and then again it follows its own fundamentals from last couple of years natural gas also comes out with its inventories obviously the department of natural gas comes out with its inventories on thursday night so that is where again natural gas also has its own movement so what what you are going for is it is true that it is now more market driven than crude oil also as of now and uh, like uh, india is being made to pay premium for the crude despite it being closer to the middle east whereas the us and the europe are being sold crude at a discount we've not been able to lobby it properly and we've not been able to negotiate good pricing and do we see that situation changing? I hope so. Particularly because of uh, recently where Modi has been able I, I, to have... I would put it in a different manner. Even if that situation is... Basically what happens is in that case, it's a hard bargain which we are trying to put in. Why not look at it from another perspective? If India as a country can hedge its own consumption or whatever we need to import, these people automatically will start bargaining. We are not doing that. Actually, we are economists getting over there. That's the problem. That's the problem. I mean, personally, whenever I read an economist predicts, I turn the page of that newspaper or book. Because usually they are always late in predicting the stuff. I mean, whatever has happened, we know. We need to understand what's going to happen. And uh, US, is, uh, US had a uh, law whereby it kind of prohibited it from exporting the crude. So now I think they are the equations are changing. See, originally US itself was a net importer. So obviously they did not want anything to go out of the country. But now the situation is different. See, US consumes 14 million barrels a day of crude oil. Current statistics. All right. US has is producing 11 and a half million barrels a day. And as of now, there is no much shale coming in. Shale is still being produced but stocked. It is not yet coming as, as normal consumption. Once the prices are proper, that also will be coming in. And, and if the substitutes are there, because US itself has come out with the E95 and E85 fuel, where ethanol is mixed in it, 
and if crude oil prices again go above $60 a barrel, the ethanol that is produced from corn will be mixed into the gasoline. So again, there is a cost of uh, benefit that American consumers will be having. In India, we still don't have that benefit. Though we are one of the largest producers of sugar cane in the world, it is a very sensitive thing that directly to convert cane into ethanol because otherwise the sugar prices are affected. But a country like Brazil has been able to do it very successfully. So see, there are a lot of policy issues which we have got stuck up with. And that is what these people have to work out. I don't know whether, as you said, economists can't work this out. You require proper strategists only to sit there and work it out. Sir, at what level you think uh, the U.S. will be interested in bringing the prices down? Like, say, for example, if the if the prices rise above maybe 65 or 70, so at what level will be the uh, U.S. consider consider it like important to bring it uh, intervene? Like, number one, number two, uh, you are mentioning the new technology which is going to reduce the cost of exploration uh, by 22 percent. So is it already taking place or will it take uh, some more time for it to uh, materialize? Okay, second question answer, answering first. It has already been commercially implemented. A lot of companies who are looking at new oil wells for fracturing, it has already been introduced because for them it is much beneficial. The old ones which are there, see where the, already the pipelines have been put, you can't do much unless you remove that and again you put it but see the problem what happens is if you remove it the earth collapses within itself there's an implosion so you can't do anything about it but they will try and find some other way out because that's what uh, one of the geologists was saying that 500 meters away from the old well the new can be dug up and it could be connected with the old one but i don't know how far this was still a, a very uh, superficial talk that I was having with one of the geologists of Halliburton. So I'm keeping that aside. Coming to your first question, US again is a country driven by principles and they will not want their own people to suffer unnecessarily when US is also one of the largest producers of crude oil. So it is very necessary for them to keep the prices in check on the upside also all right and it is a very very given scenario that if by chance crude oil moves to 70 dollars a barrel 75 dollars a barrel the shale production itself will double and hit the market i am telling you us requires only one more year to make those dual pipelines in work and once it happens they can control in whichever direction they want it whether we require it on the import side or we require it for the export side of it. And that itself may put a ceiling also on the crude oil prices. Yeah. So one more. Uh, I'm so sorry. It, I didn't know it was uh, it was there at the edge. It's about the hedging by the Jap uh, Japanese and the Chinese. Uh, how effective are the Chinese also? Like, is it... Uh, uh, is it as effective as Japanese are doing it? Like how uh, how much uh, India can do it? Like I can I can give you one example so that it will be very clear about their effectiveness. We import a lot of light bulbs from China. Havels and all many companies are there. They all have a Chinese unit, and we are bringing in the light bulbs which are being sold today are less than the prices of zinc. And zinc and tungsten are the most important constituents of any LED or any of the light bulbs. If their raw material is zinc and tungsten and they are giving you the light bulb at a price cheaper than them, isn't, aren't they effective in their hedging purposes? This is an open statistics. I mean, it, such reports will be published soon when there when there will be an anti-China move. But the question is, this is what is the current situation. And this is across the board. Why do you think cement and all becomes so cheaper coming in from China or the steel? I mean, obviously, the iron ore prices are the same across the world. 
everybody is removing the 63% fineness iron ore, everybody is converting into steel, everybody is looking into the large scale economies, then why steel from China is much cheaper than the steel that is produced in India? That is because obviously the London Metal Exchange has the most vibrant steel forward market and the Chinese economy, government, companies, individuals, everybody is playing the game of speculation, whether it is on the hedging side or gambling side, that is their lookout. But it has been beneficial for them. Do you think they are more irrational? Then we can remain solvent, you know? No, it is true. But see, then, then that is how we have to look at it. Now, that is one of the statements that I used to hear when I began my career. I am a speculator. I can't consider myself as an investor. But the question remains is, I have lasted 23 years. So either I have lasted due to good analysis or luck. I don't know. But I have lasted and I have thrived. I can promise you that. <laughs> uh, how much uh, renewable energy that we are all hearing is going to affect the entire balance of uh, this crude and, uh, and the diplomacy that is around it? So are we looking into solar specific solar, question? Solar, uh, windmill and uh, maybe now I have heard that even nuclear uh, is uh, nuclear technology is entering the renewable part. See, nuclear has always been, but it's a very controversial topic where a country like India is concerned because whenever we want to set up a nuclear power plant, there is always an issue. Okay, in case if there is a blast or anything, as it is, such a thing has never ever happened except for the Chernobyl in Russia. But that was again some, okay, that was a conspiracy theory, so we keep that aside. But the question is where solar is concerned because that is the most cost effective but the question remains is we do not have that much of place to set up solar farms to actually substitute it with the conventional energy sources. And even if we, let's say, take it on a smaller basis where each building of every city town picks it up, there is a limitation to it. See, there is a, there's a cost of maintenance to it also. And in a tropical country like India, if we have rains, it is very difficult to generate captive solar power. All right. If it is cloudy again, the effectiveness goes off. All right. Again, you have to put a lot of restrictions on people moving around around the solar panels on terraces in case if it is there, because the the thing is the heat which is being generated is too much. By chance, if a person touches it or something, there could be burns. Or if children are playing and if a ball hits the panel, the panel cracks, and the replacement costs are very high. See, the generating and the distribution costs are very cheap, but the panels by themselves are pretty expensive still. But the world over, I think, uh, for example, in Chile, that the solar is now highly, highly used as a Correct. source you of energy. You have to also look at the civic sense of each country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And how much uh, the uh, US dollar is actually stabilized or maybe manipulated due to crude uh, prices? No, where, uh, where crude oil prices are concerned, I do not believe that uh, there is any connection between the two. US dollar is strengthening itself because that is the most stable currency as of now. I'm not saying that US is a very growing economy or anything. But it is the lesser of the evil because all other countries are in a difficult stage and this is the most stable country. So what basically what is happening is that the capital from across the world is moving into US investments and obviously strengthening the dollar even if they don't want the dollar to become strong, there is no stoppage to it. Yes. Yeah. There are two questions from my side. One is a bit of a different one. We all know petrodollar relationship between US and Saudi Arabia 1973 deal. Of course, the crude was at uh, center at that point of time, which made US dollar to rise and, and everything quoted in international market in US dollar. The point here is now since the US itself is producing the oil, and also the relationship between US and Saudi Arabia is not that LD or a, uh, what it used to be. The situation in the Gulf region probably is becoming little dicey. That's, so I would like to know something 
what's your take on those things is it going to impact the geopolitical relationship and the oil production uh, within that region that's one question the second question is the russia has a lot of investments globally on the oil producing companies what we have seen over last 10 years at least i would say that the Russian companies are investing heavily across the globally on the oil producing companies. I'm not able to understand if, if we all feel that the oil is not going to be growing beyond 60 or beyond 70, what will be the rational? Do you think that, uh, uh, you know, the rationale behind this investment from Russia? Okay. Um, as it is said, High prices kill high prices, low prices kill low prices. All right. Now, where Russia is concerned, what Russia is trying to do is, if you look at, I'm sure you must have been reading a lot about it or analyzing about where Russia has gone across the world. If I am telling you, Russia is still looking into those countries which usually, which had been the Soviet Union. They've not gone beyond those boundaries. And where Russia investments in Iran are concerned, that were there right from the beginning, from 60, 70 years. So they are only introducing new technologies everywhere around. Whatever expansions they are talking about is some of the countries now, like for example, like if you look at Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and all, See, these are the countries which, after being away from Soviet Union, have not been able to stand by themselves. They need Russia. They need that old Soviet empire to come in. So these are the countries which have invited them that you please start expanding the resources. And just like Saudi Arabia does, where most of the production is done by the American companies. There is no local company out there. Everything is a joint venture with USA or Britain. All right. The same thing these countries are doing that everything is a joint venture with either Rosneft or the Russian oil corporation or the third company. But the, and everything is a royalty sharing basis only. So the expansion, what you've been reading is happening in the same oil wells that used to be years ago. Now, where your concern is, what about the pricing factor? All right. See, when the oil prices had collapsed in the last two years, there was already a report that there were 23 oil wells that were going to come up across West Asia, nearly 11 or 12 of them. Canada was going to open up with four or five. A lot of US was planning to explore the Florida Keys, which was always due to environmental issues. US never used to look into it. But with crude oil prices remaining above 90, they said, hell to the environment, we need to open it up. Because the Florida Keys, the the reserves are equivalent to Saudi Arabian reserves for 200 years. And that is not very deep. Within 50, 60 feet, that oil can come out. But the only thing is it is offshore and that's why it becomes a little expensive part of it. So again, I reiterate at a particular point, whether it is Russia or whether it is USA, they all will fall under the same category because you cannot angry your own people with unnecessary rise in the prices when everybody knows there is crude oil there. Coming to India, we have a lot of crude oil in the Indian Ocean, but the question is, it's not just working out in our favor because it is lying in, in, on, in so deep uh, for, I mean, I mean uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 400 nautical miles or something of that sort. So a part is uh, uh, where our own ter territorial waters are concerned and the part goes into the international waters and that is where the disputes are going to arise that in case if we've taken up the oil from the international water we've not able to come to an agreement to that with other oil producing countries because we need that technology we don't have the technology to go so deep into the indian ocean to remove oil but yes a point can come where it has to be removed it will be removed so oil is there enough whatever we've been hearing that oil will last for 20 years 30 years see there was an understatement which they never used to come out with that cheap oil is not going to last for so many years but now the question is that expensive oil will not last for a long time and at that particular point of time there were no technological substitutes now we have them so again 
only if there is a terrorist activity or a full fledged war in west asia the prices can go anywhere which i also cannot predict i am going as per the normal economic factors in a normal situation slight here and there what we are seeing is happening but how long can they do it even the opec deal is only valid for 6 months after 6 months everybody is going to say we want to produce more we want to export more because it is our country that is at stake because everybody has lost their forex reserves you have your answer to that the yet yeah, thanks for that thing the first question also but just to to mention about the investment from russia i think they have done a lot of investment even outside the erstwhile soviet union like in african countries so recently even in india where in an sr uh, they have uh, a huge investment uh, rosnap uh, of course you are absolutely right in saying that overall it's a market force which determines the the price of an oil but i just wanted to understand a rational for the russian government or a russian company to to go for that investment but i think they are uh, they are controlling their market share see we should not forget that india used to be a soviet ally to for a long long time so russia had a lot of resources a lot of connections out here and they are trying to exploit it because yet we've ne- we've not seen the american companies come in over here so obviously it's first come first serve basis as what our government says whoever gives a better price we move with it and where sr is concerned sr also had original russian connections and now they are coming back into it so it is just that and where africa is concerned russia is looking more towards the gas part of it and not the oil part of it because the hydrocarbon map of africa is more gas related so again everybody knows the importance of gas which i just mentioned and that is the reason why they are trying to explore into the africa but again africa is not a very stable continent the government and the militia both are the same Uh, would you also throw some light on my first question about uh, the geopolitical situation in the gulf region what how do you see that thing is the development see a if question. if they want everything to go proper see there is uh, as of now there is a lot of unemployment in the region that is what is resulting in all these terrorist activities and all that if they can generate good employment and everything should work out fine now again uh, a parallel situation uh, i think you were the one to ask petro dollar right to me okay so where petro dollar is concerned look at it from a different angle petro dollar was a term which some nice journalist and economist had given and we accepted it whenever most of these gulf countries whenever they are exporting crude oil they may be taking part payment in dollar terms or whatever currencies they want but there is a very big issue to them because these are all the countries that do not produce food grains and even where a country like india is concerned many times we are giving them wheat for oil it's the food for oil program which a lot of countries have launched now petro dollar is a term where they've tried to do it where the balancing takes place so if i am giving you so many million tons of wheat you are giving me so many million barrels of crude oil there is some value gap and that value gap is fit in by the payment which is called as a petro dollar all right but in the current situation what is happening is crude oil prices and food prices are more or less now getting equated if we if we uh, bring out a common denominator and that is where these people situation is that it is better to at least have the food intact even if we have to make a loss on the crude oil exports because if there is there is hunger in the country there is going to be an issue and the gulf countries particularly are very unstable where that is concerned even the security part uh, saudi uh, kingdom security which has been protected by the us government at this point of time absolutely But now since it is the situation scenario is going to be changed uh, probably the expectation or what we read uh, is that True. the region is going to have a little bit of a shaky times uh, in in the coming years you know True. So. but i am not only restricting myself to saudi arabia i'm re- i'm going for all the countries see however whatever insurgency instability whatever is happening in these countries at the end of the day whether it is the militia the terrorists or good people everybody requires food to eat all right and they have to get it from somewhere and that is only going to come out from a few countries only
sir one question by seeing all these developments uh, how do you forecast for the crude for next 2 year 5 year 10 year down the line and considering all things are normal there is no any extraordinary events happening and by considering other development also like electric cars and other technological developments see i i i um, there was an article which i had written in financial times london that i am seeing crude oil eventually go the way of kerosene that it is going to disappear in the future we are going to have various kinds of technologies fuels and everything that can easily replace crude oil so crude oil may become just as important as kerosene is i would say in 10 or 15 years not uh, during our lifetime only <laughs> not for the next generation it's just a matter of five year peace in the world and crude oil will be the cheapest commodity available wow can you share this article with bcs we would love to share this article oh, this was an article written 5 or 6 years ago i'll i'll try to hunt it down i don't keep copies sorry for that but anyways i i'll try and send it across and i think they can publish it in one of the journals <laughs> okay <laughs> Yeah. Sure. Uh, a few countries in Europe have a mandatory blending of uh, biofuel. Do we have any such requirement in India? Yes, we do have. But the question is, at what cost? Like we started doing, uh, like uh, the Kakinada port in uh, the south and the east. We were importing a lot of palm oil from Malaysia and Indonesia specifically to burn it into biofuel. But the question remains: is it is only feasible? if vegetable oil prices are low and the crude oil prices are high the current situation is the vegetable oil prices are higher than the crude oil prices so how do you burn it because even if we take like for example just a statistic like uh, uh, palm oil is around 560 rupees per 10 kilograms you have to add 100 rupees to it to get it into biofuel now if you look at that equivalent it will it is costing you 62 dollars a barrel but currently crude oil itself is 53 dollars a barrel so why do i use biofuel for that yeah see this was all uh, you know commissioned because everybody thought that crude oil is heading for 150 200 and it's like we may not have petrol suddenly one day to fill up our cars but where commodities are concerned such scenarios never happen you can never have sky high prices and they can continue to remain sky high for decades to come it never happens because automatically alternatives and substitutes hit in for this uh, crude refining margins which are earned by gross refining margins which we talk about do you think that it will be impacted because of the crude prices going really down and whether there will be any alternative for the petroleum refineries to crack the instead of the crude whether gas can produce the polymer based products uh gas may it, it will not be that cheap to produce polymer products from gas because what happens is polymer is part of the cracking process which happens at particular temperatures 1111 by product comes out so it is necessary where crude oil is there the petrochemical products come out a little before gas actually is emanated into the atmosphere which these people capture and they distribute it but where your gross refining margins are concerned see gross refining margins are again a statistical uh, data because what i had found is last two years reliance industries limited with crude oil remaining at 25 dollars a barrel the gross refining margin was the highest in the world which was unbelievable to me all right so and whereas if we, even if i was looking into uh, some of the americos and halliburton they never had more than 6 dollars a barrel and these people landed up with yeah exactly double of that so what was their ingredient i don't know because this is one figure which they just come out with from balance sheet you can never calculate that figure whatever it is <laughs> on web i can't say all this
efficiency, this is one part. This is the general statement. And second, to lose blood, they are getting the extra crude oil, like from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. It's the cheapest thing. And then, then they expect. See, I... Some, something is there. Uh, something completely is there. Absolutely. See, I, I, I do not dispute that because I have not gone into that part of it. But where my common sense goes is, Venezuela is the farthest country from where India is concerned. All right. The logistics itself are so expensive that bringing sour crude and Venezuela produces sour crude, it does not produce sweet crude. So there are the process is much deeper, much more expensive and still having a high gross refining margin is not gullible to me. What? Yes. Yes. No, but uh, among sour crude also, there are various degrees of it. Like where Venezuela is, it is the sour most. But where our entire West Asia and Middle East is concerned, they are. that is why, you know, we call it light sweet crude, light sour crude, heavy crude, heavy sour. See, all countries have a distinction. And Iran falls under sour, but it is light sour. So with a one and a half times process, it is cracked. But where Venezuela is concerned, it requires deeper process. In fact, where our neighboring countries are concerned, Indonesia is a better crude. It is much closer to Saudi Arabia sweet crude. But the question is, again, the logistics are not in our favor. Can you say something about South Sudan? First, you want the unity between North and South to happen? No. <laughs> See, from the oil perspective, the country is gaining some stability with the new president who has just come in. But the question remains is he has not yet decided how he wants to go about with commercializing his natural resources. What is the quantum of resources? Much higher than Saudi resources, they say. Is that true? Mm -hmm. See, what uh, I would say they are equivalent to Nigeria, but equivalent to Saudi Arabia is difficult. With Nigeria, yes. So they can be producing three, three and a half million barrels a day if proper technology and everything is utilized to it. So they can be number two. Number three. Iran will still overtake everybody, right? As as we move in time. What is the prospects of the geo prospecting companies with the crude prices being at the levels which you foresee? Hardly anything. I mean, all the companies would uh, 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 come to a saturation point that it will be like an annual maintenance for them. Okay, how can we better it? Or if there is anything in the vicinity, let's go and explore it. But absolutely new prospecting of crude becomes difficult if the prices are at a low end. Uh, I have a question. Like generally gold and crude prices have moved uh, together, like if crude prices go up, gold goes up, and if in 15 years you expect, uh, if in 15 years you expect the uh, crude prices to not be any, uh, to not be significant anymore, uh, where do you see gold? <laughs> <laughs> see, currently, crude prices are going up in the last two months, gold is still going down leave India, Indian rupee aside because for us it is a conver conversion case. But in dollar terms that is happening. I would rather say look at gold by its own self, not compare it with crude. See, these are all again economic based statistics which, see I can even uh, get you crude comparison with the BSE Sensex and all that stuff. But just look at gold by itself. Three factors, China and India, have imported less than 50% gold in last year. Are you aware of those figures? Right? India has imported about 550 tons, which we usually import 850 tons plus. China imports 1100 tons. This year they have only imported 450 tons. I'm giving you from Jan to November end statistics. All right? The world produces 3000 plus tons of gold. All right. If the two major consuming countries have reduced it by 50% and Europe every year due to the Washington agreement is selling 500 tons of gold 
to stabilize their own currency how can gold remain high there is inventory of gold that is being built up no black gold no white gold gold is gold because it is imported whether it comes through smuggling or it comes officially this is as much gold we can buy you know that is how it goes all right the thing has to change wherein if if countries decide that we want to have gold standard and they have to they buy gold to stabilize their own currency yes then gold prices will start moving up otherwise minor swings here and there without any fundamentals you've already seen gold falling from 1900 dollars to 1150 dollars which is currently and see gold is itself like a major topic like crude oil so i don't think i can take it up right now otherwise itself has a lot of statistics and a lot of economic impact starting from the uh, the nixon's era where the agreements were signed where gold became the standard where us had to follow and why gold collapsed why it increased and why it is coming down now there are clear economic factors to it don't compare it look at each commodity by itself it will be better you will understand the inherent characteristic of that commodity and how you can make money from it as a speculator i can tell you this much only <laughs> Uh, Kushal, uh, you want to sum it up, uh, or do you want to take up any other uh, five minutes more, or can, nothing at all? I think if everybody is satisfied, I am happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Equity, something. No, I uh, see what what I just wanted to bring out on the equity perspective is where crude oil and natural gas are concerned. apart from the you know the refiners the downstream and the upstream companies the petrochemical companies the plastic industry uh, there is a lot of uh, the fertilizer which i brought in indirectly see everything has an impact of crude not only that but nowadays even the specialty chemicals is looked in the in a sector which is moved into the pharmaceutical in a big way so some of the uh, you know active pharmaceutical ingredients or the apis as we call there is a lot of crude oil pricing involved in it because there are a lot of products which are developed from that and a lot of artificial synthetic products which come in from these petrochemicals so all this has a direct impact of the crude oil pricing one has to just understand at what price which company is likely to be impacted and the analysis becomes as simple as that to make money from that company obviously that will be a medium term analysis but it is a very good uh data to at least move in and out of certain investments so please so uh, throw some light uh, on the comparison between the chinese growth and the indian growth now like say about uh, 30 years back when china was uh, starting uh, we were uh, we have read reports like china acquired uh, oil field left right center across the globe like okay so do you think like uh, you know, india is going to do it like ongc oil and all that they are going to do it because there are a few here and there scattered uh, acquisitions do you think that trend is sustainable possible see see what is happening what has happened in the past is the chinese government itself through various corporates that they had created they were acquiring and then they were being given into the hands of private people but the politburo used to maintain whatever is going on where india is concerned we don't have that kind of a policy where the government pushes the private players it is us who decide what we want to do and what we don't want to do and obviously as individual corporates we cannot think about the country we have to think about our own profit and loss accounts all right so the two countries the way they have moved is in a very different manner china though a communist state moved in a very capitalist manner in capturing the natural resources of the world india though a capitalist country has moved in a very socialistic manner where all this is concerned so it has been unfortunate that there has been massive growth on their side and we are still struggling with ourselves because whatever gdp numbers we give 
statistically still they are wrong because if you look at the formula in which they have been created there was just still two months ago they removed that 15 percent weightage was given to typewriters rather than computers it was there in the newspapers i'm just uh, reading that out to you so if if this kind of a concocted statistical figure if we have to go our real gdp cannot be seven percent it has to be less than five percent and again certain agricultural products which india is supposed to thrive on are not involved only in the whole statistics for example sugar is given a huge weightage where we do nothing with sugar sugar is nothing but a political commodity another political commodity so if such commodities become part of the gdp there is always a problem that is why there's a massive difference between the real income growth and what what is uh, predicted by the economic surveys which come out before the budget thank you thank you i will uh, request krishi to make a few announcements and propose a well deserved vote of thanks some lecture meetings on 11 january wednesday we have ar krishnan chartered accountant who will speak to us on important case laws of 2016 in service tax the venue is here then we also have on 25th january wednesday tp oswal will speak to us on global developments in international taxation impacting india we have a workshop for two days on mergers and acquisitions on 27 january and 28 january at st regis hotel next to palladium lower paril also seventh residential study course on ind as 16 february and 18 february ras resorts silvasa so please uh, if you all want more information you can see the newsletter and please register as early as possible are coming coming to the pleasant task respected president chetan shah suhas seniors and friends on your behalf i thank uh, kushal takkar for sparing his time efforts and sharing knowledge and experience with us he has taken us around the globe with respect to crude oil and its products he shared his research statistical analysis he has touched on technological factors financial aspects hedging tendencies issues strategies with this we have perhaps learned how to speculate and become better investment consultants let us put our hands together to <laughs> thank you